How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah? All right, I realize I am right before lunch, so I won't, I'll try to keep this somewhat short so like nobody passes out from like blood sugar or anything. Um, today we're gonna be talking about consistent distributed elixir. And uh, I'm really, really excited about this because I've been uh, working on some of this stuff for a few months now. And so it's nice to finally get to talk about it and uh, get to, I don't know, share a little bit about the, uh, the pain and the journey. But before I get into that, um, I have a problem. And this is like a very substantial problem. It's like deeply affecting my life. Um, about two years ago now, a good friend of mine, uh, Lance Howerson, got up on stage, I believe it was at Elixir Conf, and said some very famous words, maybe now infamous words. Phoenix is not your application. Who's heard this? Anybody heard this? Yeah, a lot of people. And since then, it's been used by all kinds of different people. Chris McCord talks about this. We had this web directory thing, and then we moved it, and then people were mad, so we moved it again, and then people were still mad. And I think this is a really, really cool goal, that Phoenix is not our application. It's just a UI or just a window into our application. That's awesome, except now I don't know what the hell my application is anymore. How am I supposed to know what I'm building? It was Phoenix. It just made sense. Everything was so clear. And now I don't know. So I went and looked on like the most popular like hex downloads. It's Poison. And so I started wondering, like maybe Poison is my application? And I've just been looking everywhere for it. So if anybody knows what it is, please tell me. Because personally, I feel incredibly rudderless not knowing what my application is anymore. <sighs> Elixir's awesome. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, we're all here. This is like, this is obvious, right? I shouldn't even have to say this. When I say Elixir is awesome too, it's like, I don't just mean the like nice syntax over that Erlang nonsense. And I don't mean the beam, I don't mean the runtime. I mean all of the people involved in the Elixir community. It's such a fun, fun, amazing time to be part of this. And if you're new, welcome. Uh, it's, it's, you're, you're joining at a phenomenal point in time. Because none of the best practices and all that stuff have really been figured out yet. It's still early days. We're still able to kind of push against these preconceived notions that we have and try new things. And I think the greatest failure that we could have right now is to just assume that we figured it all out. These are our tool sets. This is what we're gonna stick with and not try new things and push the boundaries and see what works. Um, and that's, you know, I hope that everybody uh, can continue to do that and continue to push the boundaries of how we work. And I think Elixir in general and, uh, you know, the Beam runtime is uniquely sort of situated to help us do that. I know for me, when I started doing Elixir, um, it was a total sea change in the way that I thought about programming. And it, it wasn't because of pattern matching or immutable data or any of those things. It was because of the humble process. The idea that in Erlang, the unit of computation is a process. It's a thing that you can start inside user land and it's how you do everything, right? If you wanna hold on to state, you spawn a process. If you want concurrency, you spawn a process. And that just totally blew my mind. It just completely, completely altered the way I thought about programming. One of the things that I always took away from that is Elixir just started making so many things that had been so hard before so easy. They were so close at hand. Now, as I've gotten more into Elixir, I've realized that occasionally Elixir and Erlang make some things that should be very easy, very hard, um, but that's a different talk. <laughs> um, uh, maybe tonight, when we go out, I can have a beer and then I will tell you all about those things. Um, but that's for later. So I wanna try to like peel apart what makes Elixir, what makes Erlang so special. And I wanna do that by presenting some hypothetical pro uh, problems that we might encounter in our daily life. And then look at how we can leverage all these great tools to solve them.
All right. So our first problem. We want to limit access to an external resource, right? Say it's a file on disk or it's an external service. Maybe they're rate limiting us. Uh, for whatever reason, we need to limit access to that resource to run to one reader writer at any given time. In a different way of presenting the same problem, we need a lock or a mutex around some resource somewhere. This is a pretty common problem. And luckily, we're on the beam, and the solution is obvious, right? Let's just use processes. Let's just throw the state into a process, and then we'll be able to like, create our lock. And the way it's going to work is really straightforward. We'll take just a new process. We'll give it some initial state. We'll say that it's unlocked to begin with. And then when clients want to interact with it, they send it a message. So for instance, they might send a lock message. It'll go ahead and lock that process. And we respond back with the OK. And we let the client know that they have that lock. And they can do whatever it is that they need to do. When they're done with it, they send a very simple unlock message to the process. It unlocks it by switching to a new state and sends a message back. Have I lost anybody yet? We're all on the same page, right? Cool. This is like no judgment. It's cool. Um, so the nice thing about this pattern is that this works just as well with multiple clients. So if I have another client that wants to interact with this thing, well, the first client can send a message. It can go ahead and move to a lock state. And we can respond back to that client. And in that interim, if the second client wants to talk to that a lock, it'll send a message. And that message will fail. And that's what we expect to happen, because somebody else has already got this lock. So we'll let that client know. And that client can either spin lock or whatever it needs to do to wait until the lock is released. Until finally, uh, the first client can send a message back. We'll go ahead and unlock it. We'll transition back. And then everything is good. The second client can go ahead and get the lock when it needs to. The way the code looks for this is really straightforward. We can just start with the gen server. We'll initialize our state. This is all pretty standard stuff. And then we'll just handle some calls. So for instance, yeah, we'll say that we get a lock call. If we're in an unlock state, go ahead and transition, transition to a lock state with that client. And uh, if, we get a lock, or if we get a lock message from any other client, uh, once we're already in a lock state, go ahead and error it. And uh, the unlocking methodology works Pretty, pretty much the same way. And I realize that that's incredibly hard to see. But uh, if we go and if we're, if we get an unlock message, oops, uh, if we get it, oh God, okay, hang on. Uh. <laughs> wow, all right, cool. <laughs> Damn it, Cook. Come on. <laughs> All right. Almost. Let's just uh, hop down to wherever we were here. All right. There we go. Uh, right, so we have our process. I've never actually seen Keynote crash before. That's awesome. <laughs> First time for everything. Um, OK. So here's the thing, is we have a very simple gen server. It holds onto that lock. And, and what I love about that example is it's so close at hand. It's so easy to understand how that state machine transitions and how, and we can all re rationalize about that. And I'm not here to tell you that that's even like the most efficient way to solve that problem. It's probably not. And I'm also not here to tell you that mutexes are some like unsolved like computer science problem in every other language, and Elixir is the only thing that can do this. But what I do think is awesome is just it's just how how easy it is to understand like what would be a non-trivial problem in other languages. We just create it uh, for ourselves. In general, uh, in other languages and other runtimes that I've worked in. You don't get the ability to do this that often. And you often have to default to putting your state somewhere else, for instance, in a database or in Redis or nowadays etcd or god forbid Zookeeper. Um, and then you know, that allows you to, uh, to, to like maintain that state somewhere. This is great. This is a thing that is awesome about Erlang and Elixir. Um, and it's awesome right up until you encounter the next problem that most people encounter in production, which is, when you need to run multiple nodes. 
So this is a thing that we need to do in order to have fault tolerant systems sort of by default. Uh, it's like by, by the, like, the, uh, you have to do this. Um, so we'll go ahead and see what that looks like. So we'll take our lock, we'll package it up inside of a node, and then we'll go ahead and just add a new node. And now the problem with this is gonna become pretty obvious because if multiple clients want to interact with these things, it's entirely possible that any client can send a message to one node, transition that into a lock state, and then the other client can simultaneously send a message to the other node. And now we've invalidated our original design goal, which is we, had, we need to lock access to this external resource. In other words, this is, this is really bad. <laughs> this is not what we want. Um, and so the thing that I see people most often do when they're presented with this kind of problem, it, not people that I work with now, obviously, but other people, uh, <laughs> I would never say that about my coworkers um, who are in this room, some of them, uh, is let's just use a global process. We'll just take those two processes and we'll just make them one and uh, then we'll be able to always have a single lock. Easy mode, right? So to do that is pretty nice. There's already a thing built into Erlang called the uh, global registry and we'll just take advantage of that. Seems reasonable. So our original gen server dot start uh, call would look something like this and to make this global, it's pretty easy. You just say it's global, done. And what's nice about this is we could go ahead and say like if you know one doesn't exist yet, just go ahead and start it, it's guaranteed to be global, so it's fine. So back to our example here, we'll just go ahead and remove this and we'll just mark this as global and we'll say sweet. And now if a client sends a message to the top node there, It'll get for, it can be looked up and forwarded on to our lock. And that seems to work really well. And we can send that all the way back out to the client. And this is awesome. Of course, the, the next obvious thing you might ask yourself is, well, what happens if that node goes away, right? What do we do if this whole thing just burns to the ground? So let's find out. Let's burn it to the ground and try this again. So we'll send, a note, we'll send a message to the first node. We'll look and we'll see that, hey, there's not a lock here. There's no lock process in the cluster, so let's just start one. No big deal. And that way we'll be in a good state. We can go ahead and get access to our resources again. So we'll start a new lock process. We'll transition into a lock state, send a message back to the client, all those kinds of good things. And now we're uh, in good shape again, right? My tone of voice should indicate that we're not in good shape and we're gonna find out why. <laughs> because the problem is, what if the node's not really down? What if instead of actually being down, all that's happened is that the network has gone down? I don't know, maybe AW, like, somebody AWS like ls the wrong file again, like we don't know, but there's some sort of what we would call a partition be between these two networks. Right? These two beams are no longer able to talk to each other over a network. Well, when that happens, the way the global works is it'll happily take your process out of the global registry just because those two nodes can't talk to each other anymore. So we'll see exactly what happens here is that node is still available uh, by certain clients. It still has the process running, but the top node can't talk to it. So when it gets a message, it'll look and it'll say, well, Guess it must be down. So I need to go ahead and start a new one. It'll start a new lock process, spawns it, and it's like, sweet, all, things, all these things are good. Go ahead and transition to a lock state, send a message back to the client, everything's awesome. Of course, the, the problem here is, is incredibly obvious, which is that that lock down there still exists. We have the same problem again. And if another client comes along and wants to send it a message, it will happily do that, and happily transition to a lock state and send that back to the client. And of course, as we all know at this point, this is bad. This is not what we want. This has violated the actual uh, design goal uh, that we originally set out to achieve. And even more nefarious and even just more deeply confusing problem to solve is, well, what happens when these partitions heal? What happens when the nodes can talk to each other? So for instance, this thing, Somebody you know, figures out what's going on, the load balancers come up, whatever it is, and these things heal. Well now, what do we do with these two pieces of state? We have two processes, they're, two, they're both registered globally. Uh, what do we wanna, how do we resolve this problem? 
And a different way to phrase this might be, who should win? Which pieces of these states should win? And you know, do we take the, the, the last one, the, like the whoever like, got the lock last? And that opens a whole can of worms about like, how do you know what's last? Because it turns out time is all just thing, a thing we made up and doesn't really actually work on computers all that well. Um, did you guys know NTP drifts like a lot, like a whole lot? Um, it's really hard. You've entered into this whole world of like very, very complicated problems that have like potentially giant ramifications on your business. In other words, this is really bad. These are very hard problems. And this, I think, is why most people tend to default to, let's just use the database. Because this is, this is, this is hard shit. Like, these are hard, hard problems to actually solve. And it's so much easier if you just say, well, let's just take all this state and let's just put it in something like Redis and then we'll just be beholden to whatever you know, Redis is going to give us and then, then we'll just do it that way. And I want to be clear, I'm not actually saying that that's bad. I, I actually think in, in general, most people just building applications, building web apps and that kind of stuff, you are really well served by doing that. You know, Postgres is a great database. <laughs> Put data in Postgres and, and you can use their, all their hard work, uh, all the time that's been spent into making that solution really robust. That's not, I'm not interested in telling you that you're all doing it wrong or that databases are bad or we should all avoid them. But what I am interested in is, have, is having options. <laughs> I want there to be a way to consistently manage state in Elixir. And that's the kind of future that I want to push towards for no other reason than I think it makes us better as a community, having that as an option. And maybe that's wrong. Maybe we should all just be using Postgres and Redis, but I'm interested in other and alternative solutions. So I've said the word consistent, and um, unfortunately you can't have a talk about distributed systems at all, I think it's actually potentially even legally binding, without bringing up the most misunderstood, the most overused buzzword uh, in all of distributed systems, uh, talks, blog posts, uh, everything, and that is, anybody guess it, the cap theorem. So if you don't want to hear about the cap theorem, I'm sorry. Um, but we're going to talk about it a little bit because it is useful to kind of frame the conversation here. So if you're not familiar with the cap theorem, uh, what it basically says is when a network is partitioned, you can either be available or consistent. We're going to define what available and consistent means. Before we go any further, I want to make it really clear. I'm going to make it clear again. The cap theorem only applies on that first sentence there, on that first line there, when a network is partitioned. And that's going to become really, really important. But let's define what available and consistent are. So available. Available means that every request receives a response without guarantee that it contains the most recent write. To put it a different way, given a partition, given your, you have two nodes, those nodes can no longer talk to each other, they will still service requests from a client, but they, may, they give you no guarantee that it is the correct data anymore. It might be old, it might be out of date, uh, whatever the case may be, you don't get that guarantee. You just can't know that. But you are servicing requests. Consistent, on the other hand, <laughs> means that every read receives the most recent write or it errors. So if we can't, if we're partitioned, at some point we have to say, we have to return with an error, we can no longer accept reads and writes. And we typically talk about these systems as being either AP or CP. Uh, so AP meaning available during partitions and CP meaning consistent during partitions. And again, I really want to emphasize, it's only during partitions that any of this stuff applies. And also I should be very clear and say, in most real world systems, this is not actually a binary. Like most, most real world systems fall on a spectrum in between these two things where you tolerate certain amounts of inconsistency, availability, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to use these binaries because they're useful as a way of discussing systems in general. So 
So let's look first at what available systems might look like. So we'll come up with a new problem, and uh, I think this problem will be uh, help demonstrate how we might architect things. So let's say that we need to keep track of counts, just a generic, uh, keep, keeping a generic count of something. Maybe it's ad views, maybe it's click rates, maybe it's whatever the case may be. The way we can do that is really simple. Uh, we'll take two nodes and we'll have a process in each that initializes to plus zero. And now it's important to note, we're not initializing it to zero, we're initializing it to plus zero. Plus zero is going to be a function, right? It's gonna be uh, a way to keep track of the actual count of these things. And what we'll do is instead of just storing the actual counts, we'll store additions to them. So we're gonna actually store addition operations on each one. And that, what that's gonna allow us to do, and it will become clear in a second, is it's going to allow us to roll up and, and provide a materialized view of the actual count. So, what can happen here is that a client might say uh, something along the lines of like, okay, add plus two to this. It just sends the message to the node. The node stores that addition and then replicates that uh, addition to the other connected node. And it'll also be stored. At this point, if the second client does a read operation, we go ahead and send that over. And then what we do internally is we take all of the additions that we have and add them all together. And we return, we return a real value. So in this case, it's going to be two and we send that back to the client, and everything is cool. Now, when there's a partition between these two things, and they can no longer speak, let's see what happens. So we'll send a message to the first node with, uh, let's say, plus three, and uh, send that on over. It'll get stored, and then, it, and then the node will attempt to replicate it to all other connected nodes in the cluster. When that happens, It'll hit the partition. That node will go, or excuse me, that, that message will be lost forever. And during this period of time, it's entirely possible that that second client issues a second read request to the first node, and of course, what they're going to get back is two. Now, the data here is stale. It's it's wrong for all intents and purposes, but it's okay. It's servicing requests, and that's what's important here. They can also issue writes, so for instance, if we add you know, five to that node, it'll get stored off. And now our data across these two nodes is well and truly inconsistent. I mean, that's just no other way to put it. It's, it is inconsistent here at this point in time. Read requests going to either one will get out of date data. But the nice thing is about building systems this way is that when this partition heals, all we have to do is we have to sit, ship the data back and forth. I say all we have to do, this is actually kind of a hard problem, but we ship data back and forth. And when we do that, any additions that we're missing will get replicated to, the, uh, to each node, and now we'll be in consistency again. And you'll often hear this referred to as eventual consistency, because we eventually get caught back up to the correct values uh, at a later date. But I really wanna emphasize here Sometimes you're gonna be wrong with it when you architect a system this way, but that's okay. A lot of real systems are built with this trade-off in mind. Um, uh, the canonical example for this tends to be something like Amazon's shopping cart, where it's always up, but it's maybe not always right. Maybe you deleted something but didn't actually get deleted from your cart. Everybody ever experienced that one? That's by design. They're up, but they might be wrong. Another maybe closer to home example of this is Phoenix Presence. Phoenix Presence is based on CRDTs and gossip and the way it works is exactly like this. It shares data and for a period of time that data could just be wrong, but that's a perfectly, perfectly reasonable trade-off for Phoenix Presence to make because it lowers operational costs, uh, it, it allows nodes to come and go, it makes deployment easier, all these kinds of things. So it makes sense to start to look to those sorts of things. And I would say too, if you're thinking about using Phoenix Presence for a problem, if you can make your problem fit that shape, it's a great tool, use it, go for it. There are, in my opinion though, and I would contend uh, a lot of us have these kinds of things, where some problems need stricter consistency models. And I think for many of us who are coming from using uh, database backed app stateless applications, we're already using stricter consistency models in general. 
and it's much harder to bolt your problem onto an AP solution. Um, some other examples of this might be distributed locking or databases or you know, distributed scheduling and coordination, configuration stuff, transactions. These are things that come up in real world systems where we need stricter consistency guarantees. So let's look at what it might take to build a more consistent system. So as we said, partitions in a consistent system can eventually, uh, well, I guess let's put it this way. Let's look and see what happens when we have partitions in a consistent system. So right now we have three nodes. They're all talking and collaborating and replicating data very nicely. Uh, and one of them gets partitioned off from the other two. When that happens, that node has to stop accepting reads and writes. It's not down in the sense that it's not offline to any client connected to it, but it has to know and has to start returning errors for its reads and writes. And eventually, given enough node failures, your whole system eventually has to stop accepting reads and writes depending on the, on the, on the uh, amount of nodes you have and, and, the way that the, um, and the way that the partitions happen. The way it ensures this is by a sort of category of algorithms known as consensus. And consensus sounds exactly like what it is. It's a bunch of computers all arriving at an agreed upon value. Uh, it's not the actual uh, progenitor of all consensus algorithms. There are things that predate it, but the paper that tends to get the most credit for uh, consensus is uh, Paxos. And this was uh, written by uh, Leslie Lamport in uh, the late 90s. Um, and uh, it was a paper called The Part-Time Parliament. Parliament. And uh, uh, it was written by this guy right here. That's not Steven Spielberg, although it looks a lot like it. Um, and Leslie Lamport's uh, contributions to computer science are uh, just, just mind-blowing uh, when you look at it all. Uh, beyond uh, distributed computing and those sorts of things, anybody ever heard of like LaTeX? Anybody know what the law in LaTeX means? That's that guy right there. Um, and he created this whole thing called Paxos, and he wrote this amazing paper that was couched in this like, uh, kind of like interesting uh, metaphor type story thing. And he was like, on the island of Paxos, we've discovered this way that they had consensus across these different islands. And he often would show up to class like dressed as Indiana Jones to explain how it worked. And um, I'm not sure if the costume helped or not, but in any case, no one understood how it worked. <laughs> like literally no one got it. And so a few, year, a few years later, he wrote a follow-up, this time called Paxos Made Simple, uh, as a way to try to explain and recouch the, the Paxos algorithm. And that was okay, except still like no one could understand it. And so <laughs> just many years later, there was this paper where <laughs> lovingly titled In Search of an Understandable Consensus Algorithm, the extended version. And, uh, and this gave birth to what we know as Raft. Um, and this is the algorithm behind etcd, console, a whole host of other databases and, and sort of um, infrastructure tooling. And for the past five months, uh, I've been building it in Elixir. And I'm very, very, very relieved that it's, it's, it, we're at this point where I can actually talk about it now, because it kind of works. And that's uh, very astounding to me. We're going to dive into what the Raft algorithm looks like. but. Um, before we do, I want to show an example of how we might use this library. And uh, so we'll go back to our original problem, which is we need to limit access to an external resource. So we'll just take the code that we had before, our gen server here, and we'll just do a little fix up on it, and we'll turn this into a raft state machine. So you can literally just uh, take gen server, we'll say use raft state machine instead. Um, and the init, we don't actually have to say OK anymore, we can just return our initial state. Uh, those handle calls cease to be handle calls and instead become handle writes. And they only take a message in the existing state of the um, state machine. And in this case, we don't have to reply. We just return a two tuple. Uh, and we return the, um, excuse me, we return uh, what we want to return in the first, uh, the first element and the new state in the second element. And we can give it this similar treatment to all of our other callbacks. And I'll just breeze through this since I think that's probably incredibly hard to read anyway. When you actually want to start this thing, you just have to say uh, start peer. You have to give it a name, and then you finally set the configuration. 
Uh, and then once you've done that, you can issue rights to, uh, to one of the nodes. And you can issue all kinds of rights. This still maintains the same semantics that we have with our original lock. And uh, uh, we can continue on. And now we have a truly distributed, replicated lock that provides consistency across all of our nodes. And uh, I was going to have a video of that, but screw that. Uh, let's just g do it live. Um, and maybe Keynote won't crash again. <laughs> um, and we'll just go for it here. So uh, we'll fire this up. Sweet. OK. It's all still working. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, it, this still makes me so giddy. Like, <laughs> like you don't, it's not, I'm not kidding. It's like five months. Um, so uh, what we have here is we have, um, that's our client right there. And then the two pane, the three panes on the far right, uh, the top one's our leader, and the bottom two are followers. We're going to describe what that means in just a second. But what's important to note is that that top node is the node that is uh, taking all of our reads and writes and doing the replication to the other nodes. And so down here in our client, I'll uh, make that a little easier to see. And we're going to issue some commands from here. So what we'll do is we'll say, we'll uh, give it the name of our node or a peer, I guess I should say, at the node. And we'll ask for the leader. And we get that node back. Sweet. And now we can issue some writes. So we'll just pipe this into raft.write. And we're going to send it a lock message. And we're going to say that we're client1 just by saying C1. C1. Sweet. And if we do that, we get our OK. You can see that it logged it, and it wrote a new command to the log, and it's already done its replication. And now, if we try to uh, write from a different client, let's say, we get an error. And da, 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 if I take down this node, you can see, yep, the elections already happened down here. And now we can ask one of our other nodes for who the leader is. So we'll ask S2. And we'll attempt to do our write again. And if everything works, we should get back OK and error, because somebody else already has the lock. And sweet, we do. Excellent. Uh, that makes me feel so good every time that works. <laughs> and we can also go ahead and do an unlock command, so we can like keep this thing moving. Uh, let me uh, clear this so it's easier to see. And now I'll go ahead and unlock this. And it's all working again. And if we bring this node uh, back, if we bring that first node back up, we'll all be good. So uh, uh, yeah, so that's it. Um, sweet. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, man, if you want to talk later about what it's been like to work on this stuff, please, uh, I, will, I will tell you all kinds of stories. Um, but so how does this thing work in general? So uh, we start off with a cluster of nodes. Uh, they're all just standard nodes. And what happens is that amongst themselves, they elect a leader. They elect someone who's going to accept all of the reads and writes. And when they do that, the other nodes fall into what's called a follower state. And their jobs are only to accept write reads and, or, uh, writes and write them to a durable log on, on the disk. So a client comes along and it wants to send a message. So it'll send it to the leader. The leader's job is, like I said, to replicate this message. It'll send it to both of the followers. They'll also write their message to durable storage. And then they send it back to the leader. And only once they've done that entire operation can we say that this log message is committed. And once it's committed, we can then apply it to the state machine that we define as users. And once we've done that, well, that's when we respond back to the client and we say, hey, yep, that worked out. Intermittently throughout this entire process, the leader sends out heartbeat messages, which both keep uh, followers' logs up to date and also assert their sort of leadership over the other followers. So it sends these out. It sends them out uh, like a 50 millisecond um, can, kind of configurable uh, time frame. And then they get those back to the leader. And everything still works out. In the case of a partition happening between all these nodes, the leader will attempt to send heartbeats. 
but it won't obviously be able to reach the other nodes because the other nodes are partitioned away from it. Given uh, a random uh, timeout that each, no each of the follower nodes has on it, eventually one of them will timeout, and what, will, what it will do is it will start a new election cycle. It does that by first transitioning to a candidate state. It votes for itself, and then it sends out requests for more votes from all the other nodes that it can connect to. And if it gets a quote unquote quorum, uh, otherwise known as a majority of nodes that vote for it, it becomes the new leader. It uh, start. It kind of lets all the other nodes that it's the new uh, lets all the other nodes know that it is the new leader and it starts accepting messages. In the event that the client sends a message to the old leader, it will attempt to replicate, but because it can't, these messages will just fail, and it will eventually uh, have to time out and say, okay, well, we're not the leader anymore because we can't communicate with anybody, and it falls back to a follower state, sends an error message back to the client, and then everything kind of moves on. Meanwhile, the next the client can kind of say, okay, well, who are the other nodes in the cluster? Let's send a message to them instead, figure out who that leader is. It sends it over to there. Uh, that leader will then, of course, replicate. It'll um, replicate to a majority. Once it has a majority, it can commit it and send that back out to the client. Uh, and then, of course, once this partition heals, the old leader, the original leader from the very beginning of the example, it just falls back in line and the new leader catches it up on any log messages that it's missed. So it brings its log back up to date and rectifies any errors in the log. So I keep uh, talking about logs. Um, the log is really useful because it linearizes all of our writes. Uh, it's replicated across all the nodes, and as long as all the nodes have um, the same logs, then we're all consistent. And under the hood, we actually use RocksDB um, to persist this. Uh, that's one of the reasons we ended up building, or I ended up building this myself, is because I wanted to use um, a proper database uh, engine to actually store all these things. So we use RocksDB for this stuff. Uh, RocksDB is really great because it allows us to do snapshotting really well. It, it handles um, anti-entropy, anti, uh, uh, like just it's handles like things like corruption, which other databases that might may or may not be built into Erlang don't handle as well. Um, no shade thrown. Um, and it just it just takes a lot of like does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. This is all tested using um, property tests, which if you've not done much property testing, that's a whole different talk into and unto itself. And uh, I'm here to tell you property testing is incredibly humbling. Um, it finds all kinds of fun bugs. Uh, and if you're not property testing stuff and you want to add a lot of resilience and robustness to your application, you you know look, property testing is the way to go. And we're also currently writing the Jepson suite for this. So we'll actually be able to prove linearizability uh, once this is all done. Um, well, prove it. Probably what we'll do is we'll prove that it has bugs. And then we'll fix those bugs. <laughs> and then eventually we'll be able to prove linearizability. Um, so what can we do now? So we did this. And, and, and like what, what, what good is it? Well, the thing that I'm really excited about, I have a whole list of things that I, I kind of want to work on. And they tend to be in more infrastructure things. So for instance, I, I really want to start working on a KV store to be able to have a, a consistent KV store that can be distributed across nodes. Um, I'm also playing around with some ideas for service discovery, distributed lock management stuff, configuration management, some transactions. And we're just sort of playing with all these ideas. And I hope that you all can also take these things and, and you have your own ideas and how to like take this stuff and start building uh, cool new solutions with it. Um, all of this is a part of a new organization that I'm helping start with some, uh, with some other folks called Tonic. Uh, where we're trying to build a really, really robust distributed systems toolkit for people doing Elixir work, um, uh, leaning more towards doing sort of somewhat consistent uh, type solutions, but we also have, uh, have some good libraries out there for um, doing uh, event sourcing and CQRS, so if that's interesting to you and you want to talk about that, please come up and talk to me. Um, and we're just sort of trying to like provide a good toolkit for everybody to just use as a jumping off point. Um, if you want to check out any of this stuff, the links are all right here. I'll leave this slide up, so if you want to take pictures or whatever, you can, um, you can go check that stuff out after this. Um, obviously, like, if you just want to come talk to me, uh, please do, because uh, I'm happy to share the pain and also just like, talk about uh, where we might go from here. Um, there's tons and tons and tons of stuff to work on still. Um, the big things on our to-do list are just like more testing, uh, probably better operations documentation, um, and uh, 
playing around with some ideas of using LMDB as the storage adapter. Um, LMDB has some really nice properties that we might be able to leverage for this kind of stuff. And uh, like I said, I hope that with this kind of toolkit, um, we'll be able to move forward. And for the problems that need it, we'll be able to build systems that manage state safely inside of Elixir and just enjoy that nice uh, Elixir robustness that we've all uh, come to really appreciate. So with that, I'll just say thank you, and I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.